Okay, uh, good afternoon um, and welcome to our Community Connections, Your Bridge to Resources uh, seminar. We're so happy to have you join us today. My name is Chris Mostowski. I'm the Director of Marketing and Public Relations. And uh, again, we'd just like to welcome you to today's um, educational seminar on uh, care decisions. What is an advanced healthcare uh, directive? And what's the importance of having an advanced healthcare directive? We have two presenters today. Our first one is Christine Stewart. And um, Christine has been a registered nurse for the past 30 years. She's also been a part of our community hospice family for the past 30 years. Uh, Christine started her nursing career at Doctors Medical Center, uh, where she worked for three years on the oncology floor. After spending her time as a community hospice visitor, she quickly learned and uh, she had a calling to help others at the end of life, and she became uh, the organization's first weekend on-call RN. Her love continued to grow for the organization and the patients and families that we are so honored to serve uh, each year. Christine continued to take on additional duties, becoming a full-time case manager. She currently serves as our Director of Palliative Care and Pediatric Care Services. Christine is part of the State of California Coalition of Compassionate Care Pediatric Division, uh, the Pulse California Modesto Chapter, and part of the Senior Leadership Team for the Hospice and Palliative Care Nursing Association, Association Bay Area Nursing Chapter for Community Outreach. Uh, she's a wealth of knowledge, and we're so grateful that she's able to spend uh, the afternoon with us. We also have Ms. Janae Jordan joining us. Um, Ms. Janae is a registered nurse that's been with Community Care Choices, which is Community Hospice's palliative uh, care program, our community-based palliative care program, for the past two years. She recently um, was appointed to the interim patient care manager of our palliative care and pediatric services for the Community Care Choices Program. She's a licensed public health nurse uh, with previous, previous experience in the acute care pediatrics. I can't think of two better people to be joining us today to talk about the importance of advanced healthcare directives. And so with that, I'm going to pass it off. But first, before I do that, um, just a reminder that this recording is um, going to be shared uh, publicly on our YouTube channel after. So if you miss the presentation or you want to share it with your friends and families, you can do that by visiting YouTube, typing in Community Hospice, and you'll find a recording of this presentation there. Also, if you have any questions today during the presentation, please feel free to enter those into the chat box. And um, we will be uh, addressing your questions as we go through um, the presentation today. So Danae and Ms. Christine, thank you so much for joining us and I'll pass it off to you now. Great, thank you so much. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Christine Stewart and I'm gonna get us started. So advanced care planning, what is it? Have, have, we, have we started ourselves? Have you, do you know anything about it? Um, advanced care planning can be started at any time. Um, a lot of times it comes about when people are sick versus when they're well, but we always encourage that once you start like after today, you hear about it, you should go ahead and get going with it. Um, it's a comprehensive care plan for you that lets others know what it is that you want, for, you know, the, your choices. Um, it's an essential part of your plan. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, a lot of people don't think about it until they're in a crisis where they're in the hospital and they need something and, um, and then the families have to make a decision and you are possibly confused, unable to make that decision, and the family doesn't know what it is that you want, or that one a child might say, oh, well, I remember mom said she wanted this. The other child might say, well, no, she didn't. And then there becomes more chaos to the already chaos. So we're, we're big supporters of having advanced planning, which is this advanced care planning done on your for you to talk about your health. Um, so when should we do it? it? When is it used? When you're sick or when you have a progressive illness going on? Um, and we don't want to wait on something like this until when you're on, you know, death is, is looming over you. Um, it's a comprehensive care plan. Um, it's an essential part of your health care plan. People ask, go ahead and go to the next slide. People ask, well, sh should I, what if I already have one? Well, there's different types you can have. There's an advanced health care plan, which is what we're talking about now for your health. And then there's advanced directives, which is for your financial and other decisions. Those are two different documents. Um, people have also said, well, I already have a do not resuscitate order that my doctor's written and I have a piece of paper with that sign. Does that take the place of it? No, that's an older form. Um, you can still have that form, but an advanced health directive tells you tells that your loved ones what your wishes are, your wants and your not wants which is really important. Um, 
what the doctors are looking at when they when you go to the hospital for an emergency and say you cannot speak for yourself, they're looking at what is the best possible way to continue life at any extreme. But when you have this advanced health directive, it can say in that directive that say maybe you don't want to be resuscitated and have a, a do not resuscitate done to you. You do not want to be put on life supports, or maybe you want life supports, but only for so long. Um, you don't want a feeding tube, or you do want a feeding tube. You're able to really specify what it is that you do and don't want. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, about 70% of Americans are without an advanced care plan. Being in the profession that I am, I have one. Um, both of my folks have one, and I encourage all people to have, have one. Like I said, it's very important in regards to knowing what, what your wishes are. Like now today, after you heard this, this talk, if it's the first time that you've ever heard anything about this advanced care planning, you might not want to fill it out right away, but you might want to start to think about it. What are your, what are your wishes? Because when you're able to make a decision on those things, and yes, you can change your mind down the road, but when you're able to put them onto paper and then share them with your doctor, share them with your family, then everybody knows where it is that you stand in case if something happens tomorrow. And it's, it really reduces the, the confusion and chaos that can happen when we have a change in our health, because that's always sudden. Even if you're already a, uh, with a serious illness, something can happen tomorrow that makes a big turnaround of, of a change, which is not necessarily in the good direction, and everything changes quickly, and you haven't had decisions made. With this, right away, that piece of paper can come out, and the doctor can read it and go from there as far as what you wish. And it's not like too late to have things withdrawn because maybe they never even got started. Go to the next slide, please. So documents, an attorney can prepare it. Um, these are common forms. That, let, me, let me just talk, with the advanced directive, an attorney can prepare it and they usually do it when it's the financial one. Um, with this, it does not have to be prepared by, a, by an attorney, but it does need to be witnessed. Um, there are forms that you can get, I believe, um, online. There's something else that we're gonna talk about in a little bit, which is also five wishes which gets even more down and dirty in regards to what it is that you do and don't want. There is um, one that they have for adults called Five Wishes. There's also another one that we have for children that is My Wishes, which is very similar to that one. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Hello, um, I'm Denise Jordan. Thank you for being with us today. I'm gonna to talk briefly about the Five Wishes. Um, the five wishes in an advanced directive that combines a living will. Hey, Denae, Denae. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. We can barely hear you. Oh, oh, just a second, thank you. No, try. Is that better? That's a little better, yeah. Maybe um, okay. just speak Maybe a little closer to the device that you're using. There you go. Right here, right here. You just mute you. Oh, and there's an echoing, yeah. Christine, if you just mute yourself now. Okay, and Denae, unmute. Is that better? That's much better. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. Wonderful. No, thank you for correcting that. Um, so I, I'm Denae Jordan. Um, I wanna say thank you for being with us today. Um, I also just wanted to give a little quick uh, brief description on the five wishes. Um, the five wishes is an advanced directive that combines a living will and a healthcare power of attorney in addition to addressing um, matters of comfort care and spirituality. Um, it's in a format that's an easy to understand um, advanced directive form um, written in user-friendly, very familiar language. Um, it's a legal document that's available in 42 of the states um, in many languages. It's offered in 29 languages. Um, this document does help guide clinicians and patients through conversations that outline specific wishes regarding preferences on decision making, um, medical treatment, um, and comfort as well. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about um, an advanced directive, what it does. Um, an advanced directive is a document um, that a person uses to make provisions um, for healthcare decisions in the event that 
um, in the future, they become unable to make those decisions. They're either incapacitated and cannot speak for themselves. It outlines what their preferences um, will be. Um, the two main types of the advanced directives are the living will and the durable power of attorney for healthcare. Um, it does communicate broad wishes in advance and is executed if the patient were incapable of making decisions for themselves, like I said earlier. Um, it does name an agent or a decision maker. Um, so somebody that you choose that is going to be speaking on your behalf when you cannot speak for yourself. Um, and it does also include instruction and authority on um, post-death. So what you would like to be done um, following the, uh, your death. Uh, next slide, please. So as the advanced directive is a legal binding document, it must include um, certain criteria to be valid and um, recognized. Um, the advanced directive needs to be signed by the patient, of course. Um, it needs to be dated. It will outline um, the agent who will be um, in charge on your behalf that you decide who you decide that is. Um, it needs to have a witness. Um, so this is one of those cases that Christine described, doesn't need to be prepared by a lawyer, but does have to have a witness so that um, somebody can um, somebody can say, you know, I was here, I did witness that these two people were involved. Um, so it cannot be the patient, cannot be an agent or an alternative agent, and it cannot be the patient's healthcare provider. Um, one witness, cannot be, only one witness is uh, needed and it cannot be related by blood marriage or adoption. And in addition, when it comes to skilled nursing facilities an ombudsman needs to be involved as well. Next slide. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, make, oh, we can turn my volume back on just a minute. Okay. There we go. Okay. It's the role of the agent. Well, the role of the agent is making decisions according to the patient's known wishes and expressed wishes. That's why it's going to be important that it's somebody that you've talked to when you're, while you're able to talk to them about what you do and don't want. Um, some people have a misunderstanding in regards to the agent. The authority to, to speak on behalf of that patient only becomes effective when the patient lacks capacity to make decisions unless it's been determined otherwise um, and specified in the form. Go to the next slide, please. So after you've made a decision on who that person is going to be, and then you've gotten signatures done, then you, now what do I do with this, this document that's considered a legal document? Well, what you wanna do is you wanna make copies of it because you wanna, you want, all, you want every, as many people as possible, and including your physician, to know what your wishes are, because like I said, things can happen suddenly with your healthcare, with your health, your overall health and well-being, uh, especially if you have like a long-term type of chronic illness. So you make copies, you give a copy to your physician, you give one to your agent, you give one to your alternate agent, you can give a copy to your close family members, say your siblings or your children or both. Uh, and you can always have a copy ready to give when you get admitted to the hospital for planned, for, you know, planned um, admissions to the hospital. Um, and then you communicate this information when you hand it to them, you communicate to your loved ones that this is what your plan is and let them know who your agent is and that they will speak on your behalf. Next slide, please. Um, advanced healthcare directive, it does not expire unless you say so. So um, if one or more documents is done, the most recent document with the most recent date is always the one that is used. And a copy is valid with this um, because it's not a doc, we're not getting a doctor's signature. It's not an order. This is a, but it is legally binding. Next slide, please. In fact, I suggest that the original, that you keep that uh, tucked away somewhere in a good place at home and keep copies with you, you know, like give them out to every, all your, the people that you want to have them. And then sometimes even keep a copy that you take with you back and forth to um, appointments. Um, if there's, and this, this is what happens if you have no advanced directive and you end up in a situation, like I said, say your health changed and you ended up in the ER, went through the ambulance ER and um, you weren't able to make decisions on your own. So this is what the hospital does, how they have to go through the availability of the relative. First, they're gonna look at the spouse or the domestic partner to make decisions. If that person is not available or not living, they will go to an adult child. Um, they can go to either of your parents if they're depending on what your age is. 
They can go to an adult sibling. They can go to grandparents. They can go to an adult aunt and uncle, an adult niece and nephew. So they just continue down the line of who they can get to to make a decision. So you can see if you start at the top of that availability of, of um, the closest relatives, if you start at the top and those people aren't alive or available and you go farther down the list, you might end up with an aunt that really knows nothing about what it is that your wishes are, let alone that you don't have an advanced directive filled out. So it's very important that you do something like this and get it in motion. And like I said, if this is your first time hearing about it, start thinking about what your wishes are that you want and don't want to have done and then get them documented and then make copies. It, it's, you know, it's important to get this passed on. Next slide, please. So some other people say, well, okay, well, there's this other form that's come out called the pulse. And it looks just like that. It's a bright pink on a heavy stock paper. And, um, and that is actually a, also a legal document. Let me look my pages here. I think I got my pages moved around. It's a, also a legal document. Um, and on this one, you can be a little bit more specific. So you have the first part where, of course, it's your name and information. Then part A talks about um, CPR. Do you even want CPR? Do you want them to attempt it or do, you know, partially attempt it or not do it at all? Um, medical interventions. Do you want full thing, everything done on your um, of your wishes? To go that you know you want the the million dollar <laughs> overhaul, have everything completed. Primary goal of prolonging life by all medical effective means, which remember that's an oath that the doctors take. So regardless, if you don't have any of this, that is what the doctors will do when you arrive at the hospital. They'll do all measures to get you well and get you back to being stable because that's what they do. It's all at the extreme of prolonging life at any extent. Or maybe you want it for a trial period. You can also have selective treatment. And then you can also have the third one is comfort focused treatment. So comfort measures. Um, primary goal is maximizing comfort. Uh, and, then, and then you can add additional things on that that you want. Um, another big issue is, so one of our big issues when, you, when the doctors are looking for things is one about CPR, do or don't you want that? Do or don't you want treatment of any type? Then they go on to about feedings. That's a very big one that I'm sure you've heard about over the years with different people in the news and feeding tubes being removed or not being removed and going into court. And this is an area on the pulse form in section C, where do you want artificial feedings, nutrition? If you do, do you want it for long-term, a trial period, or do you don't want it at all? Or do you want some other combination of something? And you can write that on there. Then part D just starts to talk about other signatures and information that you have. So I've had some people ask me and say that, well, I have, a, I have an advanced directive, health directive. Uh, I have a do not resuscitate um, order from a long time ago. Why do I need a pulse? Well, because a pulse is an actual doctor's order because after you have reviewed all of this and filled it out the way that you want it to be because it's your health care plan, your, your wishes, when you're done with that, then you take this with you to your doctor appointment and your doctor has to sign it down below. What I tell people when they bring this to their doctor appointment, and sometimes you probably need to tell the, the front desk that you wanna have a little time at your appointment to talk about the pulse with your doctor. Because I, I don't want you to go in and tell them, I just need to have this form signed by my doctor. I want you to be able to go in and talk to your doctor about it. Um, and it's, it's very important that you talk to your doctor about it because you need him to understand what you do and don't want of your wishes. And he's gonna get a copy of this because it's gonna stay in your chart, but you go home with the original with your signed order of this. Go ahead to the next slide, please. This form is recognized throughout the medical system. Um, this document transfers with the patient. So if you go from one hospital to the next hospital um, or to a rehab of some sort, it goes with you. This is a standardized colored form, the, uh, the pink, I started to say yellow. <laughs> the brightly colored pink is a standardized form that is used the color in, in the state of California. Next page, please. Um, <clears throat> It allows individuals to choose medical treatment. Like I said, what they do want, what they don't want, maybe what they only want to trial. And it provides direction for the healthcare providers during your serious illness. So if you have one of these and, um, and something happens and your family calls 911 and off you go to the hospital, 
this is something that the family can take either right away, you can take with you in the ambulance or your family can bring it to the hospital when they arrive with you. But it, right away, it tells what it is that you do and don't want before they start any kind of treatment, even in, even in the ambulance. So it gives them direction in regards to which, what way it is that you wanna go. Because I'll tell you, it's very difficult once things get started and in motion and it starts in the direction where you don't want things to be done, but they don't know that yet. It's always hard to go back and say, take that off, stop that because my mom doesn't want that. But if you have this paper that already says, no, she doesn't want artificial feedings, but we have the paper to show, then they won't even, they'll talk to you about it in the family, but then they won't initiate that. Same with the do not resuscitate order. Next slide, please. Um, and this is the part when I talk about chaos, when something happens and if you don't have things prepared and um, for your healthcare plan is um, if you don't have, have it planned, then your family and your loved ones don't know what your wishes are. Um, maybe they're not, you know, with the pulse, maybe, you're, maybe you do have an advanced directive, healthcare directive, and, but it's not accessible to anybody. Um, your wishes aren't clearly defined on that form. Um, your physician does this, that form is not a physician's order, or when you have this pink pulse form and you show it to the paramedics, you already have a doctor's order with his signature stating what you do and don't want. Um, it allows the healthcare professionals to know and honor your wishes. And it makes it very clear then for your family members to also know, because maybe a sister from far away has shown up and is there when you got called by, you called the ambulance and she doesn't know anything about it, but because she saw that this piece of paper was on your refrigerator, she was able to show it to the paramedics and they were able to not do certain procedures while getting you to the hospital because that piece of paper was on the refrigerator. Next slide, please. So who would benefit from this form? Like I said at the beginning, um, chronic and progressive illness, illnesses that people can have, a serious health condition, uh, and then medically frail. As you know, just naturally as we age, we start to become frail and changes in our overall health. Even with good health, we start to have just natural general changes. So I always suggest that um, you know now's the time to really look into it and think about what you want to be done and not done and then move forward with getting the paperwork finished because it's not really that difficult to take care of. Next slide, please. So the pulse, and I like this, it complements the advanced healthcare directive. So you use it in conjunction with that. It's not intended to replace the advanced directive. Both are legal documents, but the pulse has a doctor's order It's a doc because it's uh, got his signature on it. So they're, they're both very important. The thing about the pulse is, so it's, you look at it and you say, well, I'm, I've made these, um, I went ahead and I did one and I made my request on it, but what if I change my mind? Not a problem. If you change your mind, then you have to start all over and get another one and then take care of what it is that you want on it and then go over it with your doctor again and get his signature. So then that trumps the past one that you had with the signature and the date. So that would be, your new one would be your new wishes and requests. And then it would be your new legal document. Next slide, please. So this is how they start talking about like the continuum of how, where does it fit in? So at, at, once you're 18, you can complete an advanced directive. I completed one a long time ago. Over time, because I've gotten older, update it. And I suggest people, you know, kind of frequently up, look at their legal documents and, and update their things and then pass and make copies and give them to their physicians and their family members. Another thing is that if you become diagnosed with a serious or chronic illness, and that can be at any age or a progressive illness, then that's if you don't have one started or you know you have one from the past, you definitely want to get one at that point. And any more, the um, hospitals are talking about that from the time you get into the hospital. They ask if you have one, and if you don't, they want you to complete one. And then this way, then they treat your treatment is based on what your wishes are, and they're honored that way. And so if you have families that come in and say, well, why are you doing such and such? Um, my mom doesn't want that. Well, the, the medical professionals can go back to the document and say, well, our legal document for your mom says she does not want such and such, or she wants this and that. So it's, it, it really protects you and what you want and don't want with your health care plan. Next slide, please. So like I said, talk to your doctor. In fact, if you're at a doc, going to a doctor appointment in the near future, you can ask your doctor for this, this form. They have these and they will give it to you. That's also a good time if, they, if you ask them for that and they give it to you, or if they bring it up and wanna hand you one, take it, look over it, and then tell the doctor that you wanna be able to talk to him about it after you've made your decisions. 
So like I said, don't just have the doctor just sign the form and give it back to you. I want you to take time to think about what you really want and don't want, and then share that with your family members and then go back to your doctor and have him sign it. Um, and yes, like I said, talk to your, talk to your family members about your decision because you know, your family members are not necessarily going to agree with what your choices are. So when you're picking somebody to be your um, representative on your documents, you want somebody that will follow what your wishes are. Next slide, please. So the original pink form, after it's signed, it stays with you. Um, let's see, post an easy to find location for the advanced healthcare directive. A universal place is putting things on the refrigerator. That's where the paramedics look for certain documents. Um, you can also get one of those protective plastic sleeves and put them in something like that and then put it on the refrigerator or where, wherever you choose is the best location in your home for these documents. Um, let's see, at the hospital or skilled facilities, they file it in your chart. The doctor's offices, they put it in your chart. And that this, the pulse form transfers with you, like I said earlier, it will go with you from location to location. So if you're, um, if you're living in a skilled nursing facility and you go to the hospital, the form will also go with you when you leave to go to the hospital from the facility. Then it comes back with you when you come back home to your nursing facility. Next slide, please. Um, let's see. Um, you can change your pulse at any time, like I said. If you cannot speak for yourself, your healthcare decision maker may request a change based on a change in your condition and new information that they know about your wishes. So if I've already filled one of these out and something changes with my health, but my daughter knows that I don't want that I wanted some other things changed, she can then speak on my behalf and we can do a new um do the, go by the new information that she knows about what it is that I do and don't want. Next slide, please. So here gives a, a comparison, which is nice. Pulse versus the advanced healthcare directive. The pulse is for seriously ill and frail and at any age. It's a physician's order for medical treatment and it can be signed by the decision maker. An advanced healthcare directive is for anyone 18 and older. There's general instructions about your treatment and it appoints who your decision maker is. They're both legal documents, but one, like I said, the pulse is a, a physician order. Next slide, please. Oh, there, there we go, that was fast. <laughs> so um, our next one that we have, I think Kristen will talk about that. Um, there's lots of information that we gave you, but now we can ask, you can ask questions and um, I'm more than happy to answer them. And so is Danae. And I hope that this has helped you some. Perfect. So at this time, thank we're just you. going to open it up for questions. Christine and Danae, thank you so much for joining us and for providing us this insight on advanced healthcare directives in the post. Um, any questions that you may have, let's go ahead and enter those into the chat box at this time. And I will absolutely read those out to um, our presenters today. You know, I do have a question um, for either Christine or Janae, and that is, um, when is it appropriate to get an advanced healthcare directive or a pulse form? Do you, is there an age requirement? You have to be 18 or older in order to have to, to write one out. Um, but I suggest that, you know, the sooner the better you, if you know what your wishes are, that you get one started. Would you agree, Danae? I agree. Um, you know, I completed one when I was in nursing school in my late 20s. Oh, thank you. Sorry. She's good. Thank you. Oh, Danae, we can't hear you. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Go ahead. Just saying that um, it can happen at any time. Um, you can complete it at any time. I definitely would agree to do one as soon as possible. Um, I did mine in my late 20s. Um, I talked over with my husband about what our plans you know, would be for me, what my preferred treatment is. And now I have the confidence and the um, relief of knowing that um, whatever my wishes are, are going to be made and he's aware. And we both know where the document is, when, when and if the time is needed, and it brings a great peace of mind. So it doesn't matter what age you are. Um, you know, it can you can do it anytime after 18 years of age. Wonderful. Um, and then I think another question is, is um, we mentioned the advanced healthcare directive as well as the pulse. Should somebody complete either one of those or should they complete both of them? 
Um, as, as Christine mentioned in the presentation, the Pulse is sort of supplementary with the advanced healthcare planning. They're both legal documents, um, but the Pulse is the physician's orders and they kind of go hand in hand with each other. Wonderful. So I'm gonna, let me add something. I'm just gonna add something, Christian, to that is um, the, health, the healthcare professionals are really encouraging that the Pulse get done because it is a physician signature, it, you know, it's an order. And if you have that, then right away, the medical professionals, the paramedics or whatnot, will be able to go by what you have listed on that document. Um, and I also like to remind people and explain to them, well, they, sometimes they'll say, well, I already have an advanced directive. Is asking them, is it for healthcare or is it for financial? Because that's another document that that one is usually done with an attorney. So, you know, if you've had them all done, that's okay. Just keep them all in a safe place where it's easy to access. Wonderful. Are there, are there any, any oh, sorry guys, I want to be just mute. There you go. Um, are there any additional questions at this time? I don't see anything in the chat box. I'll give you one, uh, another moment or two. Okay. All right. Well, Christine and Danae, um, we just really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Um, I know you guys are very busy, so um, thank you for sharing your knowledge and helping us learn more about advanced care planning and the importance of it. Um, I would like to invite our participants and anybody that would like to join us for our next uh, virtual presentation, which will be on May 26th at 12 o'clock, same time. Um, the link is actually the same link that you use today, so um, you will know how to, uh, to access um, the next webinar. And the topic is estate planning and trusts, um, which is so important and kind of, you know, ties into advanced care planning. So estate planning and trust on May 26th at 12 o'clock, and we hope to see you there. Um, with that, I don't see any other comments, so we wish everyone well. Um, everybody stay safe. Thank you for joining us and we hope that you have a wonderful day. Thanks so much.